texting me, but I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. So tonight um, is our first Big Money Speaker Series online. The Big Money Speaker Series happens second Tuesday of every month, usually at Le Bourgeois Bistro um, in Rochefort, Missouri. And there are also Big Money Speaker Series that happen in St. Charles, and that's hosted by Greenway Network, and in Kansas City every other month. And that is um, hosted by Healthy Rivers Partnership. So uh, kind of depending where you're at, you can catch some of these awesome presentations. We have different people talking about um, the Missouri River, all different kinds of topics. Um, let's see. So one more time, I'm just gonna let you know if you got questions and you're watching us on Zoom, um, there should be a little uh, Q&A mm -hmm. button at the bottom and you can um, send your, uh, your questions there. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the presentation. I'm only 14 minutes late, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so Meet Your Big Muddy is, is my talk tonight. Um, and again, I'm Steve Schnarr, I'm with Missouri River Relief. We're a nonprofit that organizes um, awesome events on the Missouri River, river cleanups, education, all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you're interested in what we do and you love what we do, you know, this is a tough time for everyone. It's a tough time for us too. Um, and if you could uh, give a little donation, a little show of your support, we'd love it. Um, the, maybe the easiest couple of ways are a PayPal donation to our uh, <clears throat> River Relief at riverleaf.org email or right to our website, which is super easy. In fact, you can even set up a monthly donation five bucks a month or whatever you want. Um, that, that's the sort of thing that keeps us going and totally appreciate that. So tonight's talk is called Meet Your Big Money and uh, I call it a Missouri River Primer. And this is um, a really kind of broad look at, at sort of the Missouri River. Now, it's a huge topic. We've been doing the speaker series, the Big Money speaker series for over 10 years. Um, and we have not run out of topics about the Missouri River. So about everything I talk about tonight um, is something that that you could have your, you know, there could be a whole talk about that. So um, I'm going to I'm going to move through a lot of topics. Um, I hope it's interesting. Um, we'll cover a lot and nothing deep enough. Uh, but while I'm on the subject of thanks, I do want to I stole a lot of slides from a lot of people. So one of the perks of doing the Big Money Speaker Series is having access to some, you know, cool presentations and data about the Missouri River. So here's a few names of folks that really helped out over the years. Um, Rob Jacobson at USGS has been a huge help, and some of his sl sl uh, slides are just you. I just use them straight as they are. Um, Jim Denny from the uh, he's retired, used to work for the Department of Natural Resources, and um, he's a, a historian, lifetime historian, and he. He lent me a bunch of his slides as well. Tim Haller with the Big Muddy National Fish and Wildlife Refuge um, and Mike Chapman with the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. Those are really just a few. I've probably stolen some from other folks too. So thanks to all of you in advance. You see something that was, that was yours. So I'm gonna start out with a little historical quote. Um, first of all, you know, this image here is, is a painting by Brian Haynes. Um, and I believe this is of uh, the Missouri River near uh, Defiant. Um, and this is kind of a look way back in time, obviously. Um, but I am also, it looks like my video did drop out. So I'm going to see if that'll get going again. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Um, so this is a little piece from um, an article written by George Fitch back in 1907 about the character of the Missouri River. And um, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So this is the Missouri River before it was channelized, before the dams were built. Um, this is what George Fitch had to say. And his article was called, The Missouri River, Its Habits and Eccentricities Described by a Personal Friend. Um, so he said, there are rivers of all lengths and sizes and all degrees of wetness. There are rivers with all sorts of peculiarities and with widely varying claims to fame. But there is only one river with a personality, 
habits, dissipations, a sense of humor, and a woman's caprice, a river that goes traveling sideways that interferes in politics, rearranges geography, dabbles in real estate, a river that plays hide and seek with you today and tomorrow follows you around like a pet dog with a dynamite cracker tied to its tail. That river is the Missouri. The Missouri River was located in the United States at last reports. It rises in the southwestern part of Montana and tumbles, slides, meanders, sidesteps, and plays leapfrog for 4,200 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. Now there are people who maintain that the Missouri flows into the Mississippi and becomes absorbed by that noble stream just above St. Louis. But in reality, there isn't any Mississippi left to view after it meets the Missouri. The Mississippi is a beautiful majestic stream which minds its own business. It flows placidly along the course laid out for it by nature ages ago. It's stable as a brick house. You can always count on finding the Mississippi just where you left it last year. But the Mississippi in the Missouri is a tawny, restless, brawling flood. It cuts corners, runs around at nights, fills itself with snags and traveling sandbars, lunches on levees, swallows islands, and small villages for dessert. So that is the Missouri River that George Fitch knew and uh, a little different than the one we have now. So. Um, I am going to check in with Melanie occasionally and just make sure we're good. If there's any questions, cool. So this is a look at the United States, of course, and that blob in the middle is the Missouri River watershed. I'm in Columbia, Missouri. I don't know where you are. Um, I see people from all over on the stream, which is super cool. Um, but uh, this and, you know, as I, as I do this, I'll start to learn my tools here, but I think I have, uh, I have a little spotlight that I can show um, spots on the, on the screen that, that I'm looking at. So this is all of the water that flows into the Missouri River. If it rains or snows anywhere in here. Um, oh, okay, so I can't do that. All right. If it rains or snows anywhere in here, it is going to end up in the Missouri River. So this is what generates our river, and it generates the character of it. Now, this next map is looking at all of the Native American tribes across the country and sort of the language groups um, and the different family groups. And if we kind of zero in here a little bit, um, if you see my red dot, I'm in St. Louis here and the Missouri River cruises up and we have all of the different tribes that lived along the river here. So the Missouri, the Kansas, the Odo, the Iowa, Omaha, Yankton, Ponca. And uh, as you move up into uh, South and North Dakota, there's the Arikara, all of the Sioux tribes, the Teton, Hunkpapa, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, all of these people that lived along the river um, for many years and they all sort of found the spot that worked for them. Um, and their, their culture, you know, maintains on the river today. Um, and we'll hear bits of their stories tonight, but there's so much more to tell. Now the first Europeans that wrote anything down about the Missouri River um, were a couple of French guys uh, coming down from um, from up north in the Great Lakes. And they rode in birch bark canoes down that placid Mississippi River that George Fitch was talking about. And, um, and their impressions of the Missouri when they got to the Missouri River were uh, pretty astonishing and maybe even terrifying. So Jacques Marquette had this to say, while sailing quietly in clear and calm water, we heard the noise of a rapid into which we were about to run. I've seen nothing more dreadful. An accumulation of large and entire trees, branches, and floating islands was issuing from the mouth of the river Pekistanui with such impetuosity that we could not without great danger risk passing through it. So great was the agitation, the water was very muddy and could not become clear. Now the river he was talking about, he used the word Pekistanui. Pekistanui is another one that we've heard. That was the name that the guides that were with him, 
the folks that were actually taking those those folks and showing them the way down the big river, the word that they had for the Missouri River. So it was an Algonquin word for Big Muddy River. And that's what they called them, what we call the Missouri. Now, later on, uh, people started writing on maps um, another name for this river. They called it Umizurita, which was an Algonquin name for the people that lived on this river, the people that lived kind of near the mouth of the river. Um, and they call them the Umizurita, and that means people with big canoes. Um, later, de Borgmont shortened that name to Missouri. That's the name we have for the river now. That's the name of our state, and it means river of big canoes. Um, okay. So we're learning some stuff here about it. How this all works. Um, well, I don't think there's anything I can do about that, unfortunately. Now, the Missouri called themselves Neatachi, and that meant the people of the river's mouth. This is a painting of a Missouri India, Indian um, uh, done by Carl Bodmer, um, a German artist that traveled up the river in the 1830s. Um, and uh, this, I believe, is also a painting by him as well. And this um, just kind of is that character, the Big Muddy River. Now, like all these different tribes that lived on the river, most of them had at least one name for the Missouri that, that had something to do with mud, that color. Um, Smoky River, uh, Big Muddy River. There's a, a bunch of different ways that um, they would describe this river. And it usually had to do with that character of how muddy it was. Um, and uh, how tempestuous that it was. Um, and you can imagine, you know, working your way up or down a river like this with, you know, those forests that it, the river's gobbled up on its way downstream, just sticking out of the bottom. All right, now I am trying to figure out how, oh, there we go, that's a little better. Okay. So, um, you know, Lewis and Clark, couple famous uh, white guys that went up the river as well. Um, William Clark had this to say about the muddiness of the Missouri River. He said that the river, the water that we drink or the common water of the Missouri at this time contains half of a wine glass of ooze or mud to every pint. So I like, you know, kind of like their measurement system there, uh, Lewis and Clark, you know, related all to beer and wine, kind of like that. Um, but that's a lot, you know, let that, let that glass of water, water sit down for a while and, all right, so that's not going to work either. Okay. Well, hmm. Now it's not letting me advance slides, so just trying to figure that out. Hmm. Well. Okay, so I guess that's how that works. So where's all that mud come from? Traditionally, all the mud came from the yellow in the map on the page that we're seeing right now. So um, this is the Great Plains. It's the driest part of the Missouri River watershed. And if you've been tootling around North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, you know how dry it is. And you've also probably seen the Badlands that are all over that area, which really just piles of mud. So every time that it rains in that area and that water rushes down, it's bringing a ton of sediment with it. Um, this is a map of the river and it's kind of weird. You have to look at it a little bit, but it shows you um, sort of how much mud used to be in the river. So this is back in the 1700s. Um, it's our best guess of how much uh, mud was in the river. And um, Try this again. So over here, this is the Mississippi. And, and a lot of people think of the Mississippi as being a muddy river, but traditionally it wasn't very muddy until the Missouri came into it. So what this map is showing us, the width of this stream is how much relative mud was in the Missouri River 
at any point in, in time here. So we have all of this stuff that's entering in the Gulf of Mexico down here. And almost all of that is coming out of the Missouri River. Very little out of the Mississippi. Um, that still won't work. That's too bad. Um, all right. This is the Mississippi River watershed. So, you know, the Missouri is a big part of it. Um, this is everything that flows into the Gulf of Mexico, which is, you know, a huge part of our country. Now the Mississippi River is a little more than 2000 miles long, 2,202 miles long from top to Gulf of Mexico. The Missouri River until it meets the Mississippi is 2,341 miles. So it's actually longer than the entire Mississippi River, which surprises a lot of folks. Now, if you start all the way at the source of the Missouri, before it even gets the name Missouri River, at Brower Spring, and you follow that to the Gulf of Mexico, that is 3,870 miles long. That is the fourth longest river system in the world. It's a big deal happening right here in the middle of our country. This is another little look at the watershed and the river showing some of the dams that we built on it and the state lines. So you can really get a feel for um, all the states and, and some of the cities that are included in the watershed. Um, the whole drainage area is about one sixth of the United States. It includes parts of 10 states and a little bit of Canada. And altogether, it is the longest river in North America. And there I'm showing you where Brower Spring is, the source of Missouri River. Um, and that is Brower Spring. So this is sort of the first um, perennial source of water if you go all the way up almost to the Continental Divide. It's in this weird little spot where to the west is Montana and to the east is Idaho. And then Brower Springs right there near the Continental Divide. Um, and this slide is from a friend of ours that has been there before, Janet Moreland, who lives in Columbia, Missouri. She's a teacher. And uh, several years ago, she went to um, Brower Spring to start an expedition down the Missouri River all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and you can still find our website, I believe, loveyourbigmoney.com and see all of our amazing photos. Um, and he read about her adventure, which is really off the hook. So she actually started out her journey on skis. Um, her and a friend of ours, Norm Miller, who hopefully is listening, um, uh, got up to uh, Brower Spring by skis and uh, Actually, I had to spend the night up there because it took a little longer than they thought. Um, but they did find the source. This was the first spot where it popped out from the snow on one of Janet's photos. After that, she skied down, hopped on a bike, and biked until she could get her kayak in the river on the Jefferson River at that point. Um, actually, yeah, further up, I think she was on the, the Beaverhead River. And then she paddled down to what a lot of people think of as the headwaters of the Missouri. So it was about 200 miles of trip before she even got to um, what's called Three Forks, Montana, where three different rivers come together to become the Missouri River. Um, so those three rivers are the Jefferson, the Madison, and the Gallatin. And the Madison and the Gallatin both start in Yellowstone National Park, and the Jefferson starts basically up at Brower Spring. Um, so once you get into Three Forks, Montana, you enter this pretty cool rugged canyon area. Um, it's, just, it's just gorgeous up there. So looking again at kind of the precipitation of that watershed, um, you know, the blues are wetter areas and yellows and oranges are drier areas. So you can really, really feel like, you know, there's a lot of moisture coming from the mountains that feeds the Missouri River. But then it goes through this really major dry area all the way through the Dakotas before really larger rivers start coming in, bringing in much more water um, to down to Missouri, where uh, really by the time you hit St. Louis, oftentimes more than half of the flow of the river is coming from the state of Missouri itself. So um, 
And these are sort of the ecoregions that, that match up with those different precipitation patterns. So the Great Plains is the major driver, the biggest part of the watershed. Um, and it starts in the Rockies and ends in the Ozarks, right on the edge of the Ozarks. So another kind of weird thing that, um, that we know from studying the geology of the upper Missouri is that the Missouri River did not always used to flow down the path that it flows now. Um, it was actually glaciers that pushed it um, further south so that it would flow to where it is now. And I'll try to get my pointer tool back here again. Um, so th these are rivers. These are ancestral rivers that existed before the glaciers um, reshaped the landscape. And so all these rivers are feeding into what is now the Mississippi River. And then what is now the upper Missouri actually flowed north into the Arctic. Um, and uh, right now, that's how we do that. Okay, so this is transposed the Missouri River watershed and you can see um, that this whole upper part actually drained north into the Arctic. This is another look at that. So um, we have this red line, which is um, the Wisconsin ice sheets, which kind of melted, came back down, came back down and kept moving. And so they were basically moving that whole upper part of the Missouri into the valley that it falls in now. So every time the glacier would melt, all that water had to go somewhere and it basically carved out the Missouri River Valley. Um, and then if we, if we uh, look down here, this is um, the, the other ice sheets that shaped um, the lower parts of the prairies, um, so Northern Missouri. And you can see that it, it really did it push the Missouri River down into what is now its, its current valley. Um, so this is a photo near Roachport um, of uh, the Roachport Bluffs. And basically when those ice sheets melted, all of that water had to go somewhere. And so it carved out this valley and it carved out these bluffs that we enjoy now. Um, so those are really a remnant of that glacial period. Now the Missouri River, since it goes through so many different phases and changes along the way, you know, it means different things to everybody who lives along the river. And as I've been traveling around, you know, it's striking that most people, you know, they think of the Missouri River as being their river. You know, it's, it's wherever they are. It's in South Dakota, it's in Montana, um, it's in Missouri. And what they're used to, you know, that's the river, that's the Missouri River. Um, but you go up to Montana, and in a lot of places, um, the Missouri River is not the Big Muddy. And they would not even know what you meant by that if you said that it was the Big Muddy. Um, this is uh, from an area where there's a series of dams along the river and each of those dams settles out the sediment and the river is really clear in between those reservoirs. Um, and it's kind of a famous trout fishing area, which blew my mind until I got up there. I was like, trout fishing the Missouri River? Um, but you can see it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. And those uh, series of dams up there really trap that sediment. Um, so you get down near the white cliffs, that's where the river starts to pick up mud again. Um, and that is a beautiful wilderness area. It's part of a national monument in Montana. As you move downstream, then you move into North and South Dakota, and there, the Missouri River, it's mostly a series of large lakes. There's huge dams that make giant reservoirs in, in those states. And there, um, a lot of people refer to the river as the different lake names that it has. Um, so Lake Oahe or Sacagawea, um, the natives that live there, they always still refer to it as the river, but a lot of people just kind of know it as, as lakes. Um, and there you can get, the lakes have been stocked by walleye, there's uh, sailboats up in there, and they even stock some of the lakes with salmon, which is amazing. Salmon in the Dakotas. 
Now those dams also drive a lot of the energy um, in that whole area. So a lot of the electricity comes from these hydropower dams. Um, it's a major um, sort of benefit to the new system of the river that we created. Um, so each one of those lakes has a giant dam that's creating it. Um, those dams, which we'll learn about a little later, are also used for a whole number of purposes, not just the hydroelectric power. Um, Bismarck, North Dakota Chamber of Commerce calls the Missouri the most improved river in North America. So even that stretch that they have, which to some of us looks a little wild and, and unruly, is right between two dams. And most of the time, the river is pretty tame. Um, there's a lot of folks that use it up there. It's really, it's beautiful. Um, but then in 2011, there was uh, whole residential areas that got flooded because uh, way more water came out of those dams than people were used to. And that's a story that we hear over and over through the life of the Missouri River, um, kind of thinking that we've got it understood, think we've got it tamed, and then it continuously comes back and bites us. So these are all photos from the Bismarck area, North Dakota. Moving all the way to the, to the very southern end of the Dakotas, there's also a section of river, once you pass the last dam, um, called the Missouri National Recreational River. And uh, it's basically an unchannelized kind of wild portion of the river. It's highly regulated by the dams, but um, it's a really beautiful place and it's managed by the National Park Service. And once you leave that area, the Missouri River takes on a totally different character. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But in Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri, we have a really different idea of the Missouri River. Um, it has an intense current. Um, we know it as this uh, you know, very channelized, um, kind of controlled river. In Sioux City, Iowa, um, this is an old postcard from Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, there's actually a lot of recreation. There's marinas on the river, um, a lot of motor boating. Um, they've had to deal with uh, some major flooding recently on the river, but up until that point, um, people thought it was pretty tame just below the dam there. Um, this is a beautiful pedestrian bridge in Omaha, Nebraska, in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, you know, the river is really a center of those cities. It's a, it's a big part of the culture. As you move, move further downstream and more tributaries bring water into the Missouri, um, folks down in Missouri and Kansas, um, and now parts of Iowa and Nebraska, um, sort of have this other view of the river that is sort of dangerous view. So even, even if we love it, we spend time on it, we love to get out on the river, we know um, what it can do. And it can do to uh, you know, our communities and um, farms next to the river. Another sort of thing that people down here in Missouri think of as a river is that it's a sewer, um, that it's this just nasty ditch that everybody dumps pollution into. And that's not exactly true anymore. Um, you know, since the Clean Water Act, it really is so much cleaner than it used to be. There's still major pollution problems, of course, but um, the water quality of the Missouri River is, is surprisingly good. And there's so much water um, that is you know, so useful to us down here. Um, it's one of the biggest, uh, most reliable freshwater sources in the world. But it, not too long ago, you know, this is a photo from Kansas City. This is the Kaw River, right where it flows into the Missouri River. And uh, it, in that area, there were a lot of slaughterhouses, um, um, meatpacking plants, um, and, and other industrial plants that really did dump a lot of stuff into the river. This is, this is a photo from the early 70s from National Geographic magazine um, about water pollution. And that was right at the time, um, right before the Clean Water Act was passed in, in uh, the US, which you know is just changed everything for our big rivers. When you have a big river like the Missouri, you can see that impact. Um, that all of those, um, those smaller impacts can have on a river. And once those start getting cleaned up, you know, um, the impact is, a, is amazing. So this next photo is from um, that same area, but 
you know, several decades later. So this is the, where the Kansas comes right into the Missouri River, the Caw River into the Missouri at Kansas City. And this is the start of the Missouri River 340 race. So we went from people seeing the Missouri River as a polluted, nasty mess to being a major recreational place, um, really worldwide. You know, it's, um, it's an outstanding paddling course. And this race, the 340 goes all the way from uh, Kansas City to St. Charles. So it's 340 miles um, all night and all day for four days. It's uh, an amazing, amazing thing to see. Um, and the lower Missouri is also known for uh, monster record catfish. The Department of Conservation here in Missouri shut down the commercial fishery on the Missouri just a few years ago. And um, it's become home to some monster trophy catfish. Uh, this was uh, briefly um, a national record blue catfish. Um, and that record got broken by someone else who caught a blue cat on the Missouri River in a different spot. So um, now I'm going to kind of look back in time at the Missouri. Um, <clears throat> this is a painting by George Catlin from the 1830s. And it's a little fanciful. Um, it's up near what, what is now Sioux City, Iowa. Um, but the thing that you do see is that winding braided um, nature of the river. You know, that um, all these islands and this kind of wild meandering uh, look to the river and feel to it. Um, and right when George Catlin painted that, that's when steamboat traffic started taking off on the river. And this is a painting by Gary Lucy from Washington, Missouri. And it, it is downtown Washington is, is what this is. Um, in fact, that little dog, if I remember right, I think Gary said that was, that's uh, his dog, but uh, in, in the stern of that little rowboat. Um, but once steamboat traffic started kicking off, all of a sudden the Missouri River became a highway of traffic um, for commerce and people. So as people were moving west um, to California and Oregon, Montana, to the gold fields, the Missouri River and steamboat traffic became like the main way that goods could move and people would move as they were moving out west. Um, so the, the river ended up being the link up for the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, and the gold fields in Montana. Um, just a major highway for, for travel. Um, I believe this photo is from Washington, Missouri as well. And, uh, you know, these steamboats were, they were the Walmart of their day. When they would arrive in town, everybody would show up in their fancy clothes and um, check out, you know, um, all the goods that were coming to town, which was it was everything you needed to start a homestead out west or in the Midwest at that time, or the Great Plains. This is just kind of a cool painting. I'm not even sure who did this, but, um, you know, Lincoln, he, uh, before he was president, he started out as a, as a railroad lawyer, in my understanding. And, um, you know, it was the railroads that ended up bringing an end to steamboat traffic. Civil War slowed it down for a little bit, but once uh, once railroads kicked in after the Civil War, steamboats started definitely losing their prominence. Um, I think it was in the late 1860s when the first bridge, railroad bridge, crossed the Missouri River in Kansas City, and that really sealed the deal for Kansas City becoming a major um, commercial hub of the Midwest. Now, steamboating on the Missouri River, it may have been a highway that many people used, but it was not safe, at least not safe how we would consider it today. Um, you know, that earlier um, quote from George Fitch talking about how the river would swallow up islands and um, consume forests on its way down, you know, those forests would end up and stuck in the bottom of the river. Um, these were called snags. Um, this is a painting by Carl Bodmer, a, a German painter that um, went up in also in the 1830s in a steamboat. Um, and uh, he kind of captured that perilous journey that these boats had to go through. They all had wooden hulls, wooden bottoms, and they had to pick their way through these fields of logs, all sort of sticking downstream at them and wanting to punch a hole in their bottom. Um, this map is showing <clears throat> the last 50 miles of the Missouri River at St. Louis. And uh, each one of these marks is a steamboat that sank 
on the river at that location. So this is 50 miles of the river and look at all of those sunken steamboats. So taking a little closer look here, um, this is the confluence of the Mississippi and the Missouri. Now, out of the, um, all the boats, there were 600 different steamboats that, that uh, went on the Missouri River over the years. And out of those 600, 400 of those boats sank on the river at one time or another. Um, that was almost part of the business plan. They figured if they could do one trip in a boat without it sinking, they could make their money back and profit on that boat. Um, and if they could do more trips, then they're, they're making profit at that point. But uh, can you imagine hopping on a, uh, uh, an air, in, um, in an airplane today with a two out of three chance that you weren't gonna make it where you thought you were gonna go? So this, is, uh, this slide is showing um, a partial list of the boats that sank on the Missouri River. And um, almost all of them were from snags. So this, this section here is talking about 300 of the boats that sank. And of those 300, almost 200 of them sank because they hit trees um, stuck underwater and, and that's how they sank. So all of that turmoil on the river, um, the difficulty in travel, but the importance of the travel and, and shipping freight on the river. And over the years, people kept trying to find ways to tame the river. So in the late 1800s, um, the Corps of Engineers started pulling snags out of the river. That was sort of how it started. Then there was a series of river and harbor acts over the year, years that put um, lots of money and labor into channelizing the river. So the goal was to make the river narrower and that would make it deeper. And then also to stabilize the banks of the river so it would stay in one place and stop moving around all the time. So the whole goal of this series um, of acts over the years in 1912, 1927, and 1945 was to create a 300 foot wide channel that was at least nine feet deep um, and to stabilize the banks. Even though they started this project in essentially 1912, it really wasn't completed until 1980. Now we're gonna kind of show how that worked. So this is the stretch of the Missouri River essentially from Sioux City, Iowa to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and this is the process of taming the river. One of the big tools that they had was pile dikes. So these are pilings, wooden trees, mostly cypress logs brought up from the south um, <clears throat> that were driven down into the bottom of the river and created rows that would stick out into the river. So these rows, these dikes, would be joined together so that when water hit them and flowed into them, it would slow the water down and all of that mud and sediment in the river would settle out. Just like if you um, took a bottle of water, bottle of muddy water, shook it up, set it down, um, you know, came back in an hour, that mud would settle to the bottom. And that's, that's what they were trying to do with the river here. And the next little series of slides is gonna show how at one spot in the river, this process happened um, over the course of uh, the 1900s. So the process started here. This was Indian Cave Bend. It's, um, we're looking downstream. And so this is the border between Nebraska and Iowa. We're looking downstream here um, in September of 1934. And this is the nature of the Missouri River at the time. Um, sandy islands in the middle, um, winding channels. It looks like there's more than one channel here. It's hard to tell which is the main one. And that was really the character of the river. Now this next slide is taken from really almost the same point in this whole series is, is kind of from that same point. So um, later that year, 1934, they started driving these piling dikes out into the river. So I'll try to get my tool back here. Um, so this is basically where they want the new bank of the river to be. So they're creating a new bank of the river. And then these are sticking out into the current, trying to slow the river down um, so it will drop its sediment load. And 
This next slide is one year later, um, June of 1935. Now those dikes are extending way out into the river and you can see they have pushed the river to the opposite side. The islands that were over there have disappeared and there's new sediment collecting in between those long wing dikes. This is later that year. Once the river dropped um, <clears throat> after the high water period um, in October, now it is basically all filled up with sediment in between those dikes. Those dikes are sticking out from the sediment, but it is uh, slowly filling up with mud and already starting to grow trees. Um, we look one year later, August of 1936, and the trees are starting to grow up. Um, the whole other channel of the river has disappeared. There's kind of a new island forming over to the left. Um, you can tell the river isn't done, you know, with its meandering ways yet. Um, now we're jumping ahead 10 years. So we're 1946 and uh, all that bottomland has grown up in trees now. And so you can look that whole bottomland forest um, used to be the river and it is now dry land. Um, those very long dikes are now barely kind of sticking out from shore. Now we're jumping ahead 30 years. So we're in 1977, those trees are gone um, <clears throat> and it's all agricultural fields. Um, we have farmland right up to the banks of the river. So, you know, this is uh, land that was essentially formed from the river itself using the river to create new land. And so just going back to that very first slide so we can sort of see that comparison again. Here's uh, that uh, Natural River, 1934, and then 1977, um, basically when the navigation stabilization project was completed. Um, this is what things looked like in Iowa, Nebraska there. Now jumping ahead to 2003, a new levee has been built. So that little road down there is a new levee. <clears throat> Now, uh, <clears throat> now protecting the farmland behind it. <clears throat> the farmers can still utilize the land um, between the levee and the river in some years, um, but the land behind it is, is more protected, although we can still see that, you know, there's still a lot of seep water um, and uh, rain collects because it can't drain out of the, the levee protected areas. Then, um, <clears throat> Then the 2011 flood happened um, where that new lake is in the middle. That, that was where the levee broke. So when the levee broke, um, it formed that uh, wetland and they had to wrap the levee around that wetland. Um, and the river also really reshaped the bank. So you can really see that impact um, that the river has on, on the land next to it. So here's um, a little bit of how the banks got stabilized. So one of the tricks was that they would cut down willow forests next to the river. And these are all willow trees. You can see those itty bitty little men there um, working on this barge. So they would have a barge, they would load it up with willows and then weave them into what was called a willow mattress. So this willow mattress they could set along the bank of the river um, and then they would weight that down with rocks. Um, all these rocks would get laid by hand um, in this part of the river that, that I live on in Columbia, this work really happened in 1929 and 1930. And at that time there were 10,000 men working on the river um, to stabilize the river. A lot of the old families around here have you know, grandparents um, or older grand uncles and, that worked on this river project. Um, they're always really proud they had you know, built, built this new river. And so after the willow mattresses, then we have um, the rocks being laid down by hand and uh, more pilings to stabilize the bank. Um, it's crazy. So this, this became, you know, the river that we know today. This is, this is how it happened. Uh, Jim Denny made these couple of maps, I believe. Um, so I just borrowed them straight from him, but showing the stretch down by Herman. So right in the middle is Herman, Missouri. And you can see what the river looked like before channelization. Um, just a whole series of islands, some higher than others, some with trees, 
some just sandbars. Um, and then overlaid is now the river of today. So um, much narrower, much smaller uh, container to handle the river when it gets bigger. Now in that process, there's kind of a lot of cool, weird stories about um, things that had to be done to try to tame the river during channelization. This little drawing um, is pulled from a book called Unruly River, which is really awesome. If you are really interested into this process of, of how the river's been changed, um, can't get any better than Unruly River by Robert Schneiders. Um, and this gray stripe through the middle, that snake, that is the channelized Missouri River, the new river that they're creating from the wild river. So then the kind of wild meandering thing that's labeled Missouri River, that was the, um, <clears throat> the natural river at the time. Now, this map is from Decatur, Nebraska. Um, so on the, uh, the upper part of this map is actually Iowa and the lower part of the map is Nebraska. So north is to our left. Um, basically, the two communities, the two counties in Iowa and Nebraska got together and they raised money to build a bridge between across the Missouri River. So as part of that process, they had to go to the Corps of Engineers and get a permit, just like we do today, for this bridge. They went to the permit. They're like, we got the money. We want to do this bridge. And the Corps is like, that's great. You can build the bridge, but we don't want you to build a bridge over the river. We want you to build a bridge over here where... Um, and I'm going to try to get my pointer going here again. Um, we want you to build your bridge over here where we're going to put the river because we're going to move it. Um, so the people decided, okay, so the Corps told them where they were going to put the river. So at this time, here's the Missouri over here. And they built this bridge in the middle of the floodplain over here where the Corps said they were going to build their, their uh, put the river. So they built the bridge and then they waited for the Corps to move the river there. Well, then the Corps stopped getting funding. Um, the senators that were driving for funding on building the, on uh, redoing the river, sort of that whole process kind of stopped and they lost funding for a couple of years. So for several years, the two counties had a brand new bridge in the middle of the floodplain and they still couldn't cross the river. And it was only several years later that that the Corps actually went and they, they dug this, um, this pilot canal underneath where the new bridge is and they left this earthen plug here. And so when they got finished, they blew that up with dynamite. The water moved under the bridge and gradually the old river dried up um, and people could cross the river from Nebraska to Iowa. All right. So here's another look at our river now down here, the lower Missouri River. Um, and another kind of look at sort of the comparison in the same sort of place, how the river used to look, the braided stream, and uh, how the river looks now. And so you can really start to get a feel for, you know, the Missouri River used to be a major wildlife haven. Um, and it still is, it still is in a big way. But you can really see these little nooks and crannies for fish and wildlife to, to grow up and to shelter um, and to feed. So all these different little nooks and crannies in the river, the, the shallow spots, um, the islands that would come and go, uh, the new willow stands, those were all unique ever recreating habitats um, on the Missouri River. And once the channelization project happened, a lot of that disappeared. And there really was quite an impact to the wildlife on the river. Um, just one more look at sort of that kind of the old river on top, you know, where it had multiple channels and islands and different vegetation of different ages compared to what we have now, which is a pretty stable um, similar types of habitat in the river itself, and then uh, pretty similar habitat on the side of the river too. So, you know, with, with all the benefits that came with channelizing the river, um, protecting farmland, 
know, there were some things lost, some pretty big things lost. So the next big act that um, the US government did to uh, control the Missouri River is known now as the Pig Sloan Act. Um, it's really the Flood Control Act of 1944. And the Pig Sloan Act is, um, in addition to adding some, some money to um, complete the channelization project, um, one of the big things, oh, and, and here we actually have uh, um, Pick and Sloan themselves. So we've got William Sloan on the left, who is with the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and Bureau of Reclamation is obsessed with dams, um, tributary dams, um, irrigation, you know, saving water so that we can farm places that are too dry to farm nor normally. And then on the right, we have Major General Lewis Pick. So um, it's Corps of Engineers, and uh, they were really interested in um, somehow creating a river that we could float barges on consistently. So there were two different plans. The Pick plan um, really focused on um, focused on this lower channelized reach of the river that we could run barges on from Sioux City, Iowa to St. Louis, um, and then creating large reservoirs that would control floodwaters um, and also hold that floodwater in the spring and release it in the summer when the river was too low so that we could have barges in the summer as well. That was the basic pick plan. The Sloan plan involved um, a lot more dams all across the landscape. And uh, basically the pick, pick Sloan plan was sort of a combination of both of them. Um, and you know, these are again, are these um, giant dams in Montana and the Dakotas creating these huge flood control reservoirs. So in addition to hydropower, um, these reservoirs will hold the, um, I think I've got a, oh, uh, we'll wait a couple of slides for that story. But, you know, one of the major impacts um, of, uh, of creating these dams <clears throat> in the Dakotas especially was the impact on the Native American reservations that were right along the river. Um, one of the things that the tribes that lived in the Dakotas, some of the reservations were able to maintain some of this bottomland flood uh, floodplain forests, these cottonwood forests and these beautiful bottomlands, which were some of the richest um, land in the entire of the Dakotas and some of the only major forests in that area too. So it was one of the things that they managed to keep um, with the reservation system was this connection to the Missouri River. Now you can really see from this map how these dams were situated in such a way to protect larger European settlements, larger American cities, um, but in many cases flooding that bottomland forest and the reservation. So the reservations got impacted by almost each one of these dams. Um, this map really kind of lays it out for you. And this quote from Native American scholar Vine Deloria Jr. And you know, without a doubt, the single most destructive act ever perpetuated on any tribe by the United States um, was the flooding of this reservation land and creating um, the Missouri River dam system. This photograph is from um, North Dakota, uh, from the chairman of the Fort Berthold tribe, um, George Gallette, who uh, had basically had to sign this act that gave up that portion of their reservation to be flooded. So kind of stepping back again and looking at the system, um, the whole purpose from a flood control aspect of the system was that when we had the Great Plains and this mountain snow melt in the spring, that these reservoirs would catch and hold that flood water during the spring to relieve the pressure on this lower area that already gets a lot of spring rains. Um, and that's the navigation stretch of the Missouri River and the part that goes through Missouri. Um, so they're catching floodwaters in the spring and then releasing it in the summer in the dry months so that we could still have navigation and drinking water 
and power plant cooling down in that part of the river. Um, this is kind of just a comparison. These are all the Corps of Engineers reservoirs in the country. So not including, you know, some of the big ones in the Southwest, but out of all the Corps reservoirs, these three um, Missouri River ones are just by and far the uh, largest storage capacity of any of the lakes. You can really see how much water they hold. And then uh, this slide also just sort of shows you that same picture. You know, the mountain snow melt up here, the plain snow melt a little bit later, um, and then the driver down in Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri is, is that spring rainfall. So these are the, really the three main drivers of runoff in the basin. So if you took all those reservoirs and put it into just one um, giant lake, this, this little scheme here is kind of showing you uh, what all that water is doing. So what it's being used for. Um, get my little pointer again. All right, so most of the water is in this carryover multiple use zone. So basically when all that spring flood water gets let out in the summer and through the course of the summer and fall into the lower Missouri River, their goal is to get the lakes back to this level here so that all of this water is here to be used during drought periods um, for all the different uses of the river. So, you know, these giant reservoirs do not get drawn down mm -hmm. um, to create, you know, tons of floodwater control space. Um, this uh, is the floodwater control space by design. And so every year, um, those reservoir systems are, are meant to fill up to about this point and then draw down to about this point. Um, we could see in major drought years, like the historic minimum in 2007, is way down here. So when it comes to push comes to shove, um, they still got to create hydropower, still got to have navigation on the lower river. Um, so these this pool does get drawn down. Um, uh, but then this exclusive flood control zone is for major flood years. So it's that extra bit of storage to handle extreme flood events. And so that's only 7% of the total storage um, and then we can see that the historic maximum of the system was in uh, 2011. And uh, that is, um, you know, got higher than, than that sort of goal of exclusive flood control. Um. All right, by law, the, there are eight authorized purposes of managing the Missouri River, navigation, flood control, hydropower, water, water quality, recreation, fish and wildlife, irrigation. So all of these um, uses have to be balanced out. And uh, you know, it's years like last year where we see that the balance does not always work in everyone's favor. Um, and just kind of one more look at that that system with all the dams. Now, this system also created huge changes downstream, right? So um, <clears throat> these graphs were put together by USGS to sort of show um, a comparison between the uh, natural hydrograph, the natural flow of the river in different locations, um, versus like the general average flow that we have now. So this gray spike, this is um, in Sioux City, Iowa. So right below the dams. And this is what the river naturally did. It would naturally have a spike of melt from Great Plains snow melt in March and April. Um, then another spike of snow melt from the mountains um, and also other portions of the Great Plains along with spring rain in May and June. Um, then it would drop down and be really pretty low like the rest of the summer. Um, so the dam system has been able to hold all of this water in the reservoir system and then let it out in the summer 
Um, so there's more water in the summer for navigation and all those uses below the dams. Um, and then if we move downstream to Kansas City, we say the same thing, only the patterns are starting to come together. We see um, that definitely flooding peaks are reduced um, and summer flow is quite a bit higher. Um, but we still, we're starting to get like more variability to the system because of all the other tributary rivers that come in between Sioux City and Kansas City. And then you move down to Herman, Missouri, and it's even more so. So this is, you know, kind of the river we have now. So the, the blue river um, in this graph, the blue shape on the graph is, uh, is the river that we have now and those hydrograph spikes. Um, flood peaks that we tend to have every year. Oops. I think I actually just ended up shutting off my screen share. Um, okay, I think I got it back. All right. So Another big impact of the dams is the drop in sediment below the dams. So the, sediment, the dams are actually trapping sediment that used to flow from the Great Plains um, into the lower Missouri River. And so we're back to, um, we're back to this graph that we saw earlier, this map, this sort of sediment map. All right, so this is the, the, the 1700s Missouri River and then over here, we have the river of today, um, the channelized dammed river. And so the amount of sediment that's coming <clears throat> into the Missouri River and come, dumping into the Mississippi um, now is still a large portion of the amount of sediment that's flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, but it's like way reduced, way reduced. So most of that sediment is actually trapped above this point here in the dam system upstream of Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, this is like super confusing to look at all of these numbers, but the important number um, is the one in the lower right. So 16.9%, that's at Herman, Missouri and it's basically telling you that in Herman, Missouri, there's about 17% of the sediment that used to naturally flow past Herman, Missouri isn't flowing past it now. So, you know, that much less sediment has caused a lot of changes to the river. And that is another um, speaker series presentation we won't get into, but one of the thing, the impacts it's having is it, it is slowly filling those reservoirs. The smallest reservoir on the Missouri River is the very last one going downstream. Gavin's Point Dam forms Lewis and Clark Lake at Yankton, South Dakota. And uh, over on the right, we have Yankton, South Dakota, and we have the river below the dam. On the left is the lake above the dam. And if you continued upstream, you would see that um, all of this sort of braided channel green area in the river bottom there is actually uh, sediment that has filled in the lake. So that used to be Lewis and Clark Lake and it is now filling in slowly with sediment. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty dramatic. It's an issue up there. They're trying to work on trying to figure it out. Um, it's caused quite a bit of flooding last year in that area. And this is a photo that shows that sediment um, maze, you know, that have wetlands that it's created up there. Now, kind of going downstream again, um, in the lower Missouri, 43% of Missourians get their drinking water from the Missouri River. Most of Kansas City, most of St. Louis gets its drinking water from the river. Um, it is a, a major use and a major source of fresh water um, in the country. It just sort of outlines the importance of taking care of this resource. Some of the other uses, um, so coal-fired power plants um, along the river use 
uh, the river for cooling. So it's sort of a, a decreasing use of the river, but a major big one. It impacts, um, it's why all of these power plants are built along the Missouri River. Uh, another big use of the river is, uh, is navigation, but it is also a, kind of a decreasing use. This, uh, this graph shows sort of the boom in navigation, which never really reached anywhere close to the peak that was hoped for. Um, but in the middle years, you can see the diversity of stuff that was shipped on the river and how that really dropped off. This graph only goes to 2008 um, and navigation has picked up, shipping has picked up on the river since then. Um, in, in the past few years, there's a few more companies working on the river, um, but they've also been some pretty tough years. Another major use of the river is the sand and gravel from the bottom, especially the sand. And uh, this is a look at a dredge on the Missouri, um, and there's quite a few of these along the Missouri River. 80% um, of the concrete in our state is from Missouri River sand. Um, it is uh, one of the major uses of the river that most people kind of don't know about, but. Um, and this is a little look at Missouri River gravel. Um, not the best picture in the world, but one of my favorite things to do is like walk around on sandbars on the river and look for cool rocks because these are rocks from the entire Missouri River watershed. You can find volcanic rocks from the Yellowstone area, um, all kinds of stuff granite, um, beautiful agates, petrified wood, um, beautiful stuff. And while we're talking about the bottom of the river, um, this is just kind of a cool little look at the shape of the bottom of the river. Um, this was put together by a USGS crew led by Carrie Elliott. And Carrie Elliott is actually doing the Big Money Speaker Series next month. Um, so you want to find out about that, hop on our website and check it out, bigmoneyspeakers.org. Um, we'll get that page up here in the next couple of weeks and you can see what she's going to talk about. But uh, she made this map and um, she'll get into more detail about it. But basically, it gives you this uh, little look at what the bottom of the river looks like, which is essentially sand dunes, sand and mud down there. Um, just kind of zooming in a little bit, you know, at each of those wing dikes, there's a uh, big scour holes, it's where all the big catfish live. Um, and you really get a feel for that texture of the river, it's beautiful. Um, just kind of a few little look at some of the weird creatures that live in the river um, and sort of the impact that the changes that we've had on the river, you know, not just changing the shape um, and the hydrology and the dams, but you know, all the little impacts that we have add up and um, unfortunately, you know, so 25% of the native fish that live in the river are actually having some serious trouble. Um, and uh, all include, and that includes all of the fish that are really big river specialists. Um, and that's what these are here on here. These are all really um, important Missouri River fish that are, that are all having a tough time. Um, and this is a, the three endangered species that are listed for the Missouri River. Um, and really they're all impacted by these changes we've done to the river. Um, although it, it appears that the interior least turn may be delisted um, because of uh, populations that are doing better other places. So that's super good news. Um, one of the things that's been done to sort of help mitigate uh, some of the damage that we've done to the habitat on the river is the Big Muddy National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. And this little map shows some of the units, it's a little out of date, um, shows some of the units of the Big Muddy Refuge across the state. So um, there are, are pieces across the state. Right now there's about 20,000 acres of protected floodplain habitat along the Missouri River as part of the refuge. Um, and there's not funding for it, but there is authorization to purchase up to 60,000 acres. Um, and uh, this is one piece that's up uh, upstream of Columbia, upstream of Boonville, downstream of Glasgow, Missouri. Um, and this is right after the 93 flood. So 
this area, there's a big S curve in the river and in the 93 flood, the river really just blew it all out. So turned all this farmland um, into sand dunes and actually new channels of the river. Um, that happened again last year as well. But after, um, after this flood, a lot of those farmers did give up and they sold their land to the Corps of Engineers and it became part of the Big Muddy Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Um, and here's what it looks like now. So since then, um, those shoots have kind of been stabilized and new ones have been built for habitat in that stretch of the river. The forest has grown up in places that were farmland. It's really an amazing, amazing part of the river to visit. If you ever get the chance to boat or float between Glasgow and Boonville, um, it's absolutely awesome. Um, this is just kind of another look at that area and those little white spots in the river are um, massive sandbars, just super great habitat in there. Um, and as we saw last year, you know, something like the Big Muddy Refuge is, is a part of a solution um, in dealing with flooding. So flooding continues to be a problem on the Missouri River despite all the flood control measures that have been taken. Um, and one of the reasons is the amount of water going into the river is increasing. Um, and there's just not enough room for it in the narrow channel that we've created with the levees so close to the river. Um, this little graph is showing, and unfortunately it doesn't go all the way to include last year, but it does show 2011, um, which actually kind of goes off of this graph. But um, 2019 gets very close to the top of this graph as well. But you can really see that the amount of runoff, which is the amount of water flowing into the Missouri River above Sioux City, Iowa. So that's mostly coming through the dam system. Um, that amount of water, it seems like there are years where it's getting much higher than it used to in the past, in, in record um, floods of the past. So it's that high amount of water that we're dealing with in the system that keeps causing these record floods. Um, and, and of course, there's many other factors as well, many other factors. Um, when this river system was designed by the Corps of Engineers, it was designed to have, um, designed to have a, uh, a floodway adjacent to the river. So, if, uh, if this was our navigation channel here in the middle, that there would be um, some permanent fish and wildlife land in part of the river, some dry ear farmland, maybe next to the river, and then a federal levee um, a ways back from the river. So um, you would have this floodway that could contain floods that might happen every 10 years or something like that. Um, and down here, these are the, the width that was by design supposed to um, be between levees on the opposite sides of the river so that by the time you got past the Osage River, there should be 5,000 feet between the levees. But that was never really, um, it was never enforced. That design was never enforced. Um, and uh, there are quite a few levees that are much, much closer to the river. Um, than at that time. So there's not nearly the amount of room that even by design the system was supposed to have, but now we're seeing more water than the system was even designed for. So, um, and this map, um, I just got this from Carolyn Pufault with the uh, Sierra Club actually. Um, it shows this, this red line, okay. Um, this, this red line, oh, you can, mm -hmm. okay. This red line um, is the floodway by design that was intended. So from the bluffs on this side to where the levee theoretically should be back here is this uh, distance right here. So um, the, now the flood protected 
you know, levee protected areas, this whole purple area. So it's obviously super productive farmland, super important farmland, um, not to mention the communities that are protected by those levees, uh, but it does leave less room um, for the river to, to grow and flood into in those intense flood years that we're having lately. Um, All right, now that is like the end of my whole deep presentation on the Missouri River. So deep and shallow, that's kind of like, uh, we looked at a lot of different issues and just kind of touched on them. Um, but if you are really interested in digging deeper about the Missouri River, we have put together a little resource on the Missouri River Relief website um, of some of our favorite Missouri River books. And there's no way this is complete um, we'd love to add your favorite river book too, uh, but you can check it out at our website, which is riverrelief.org. Um, and the Big Muddy Speaker Series, which this is part of, um, has its own website as well, bigmuddyspeakers.org. Um, so here in Roachport, um, Columbia area, we do talks um, the second Tuesday of every month. And... Um, Next month will be Carrie Elliott from the U.S. Geological Survey, and she's really going to focus on the bottom of the river. So those cool maps that we showed you um, that she had made earlier um, and some of the mapping of the river that she did uh, last year during the 2019 flood and what they learned about what the river does during those big flood events, uh, which should be super cool. Um, and I do want to like give a moment for questions. Um, trying to see if I can see if anybody does want to raise their hand and we can try to do audio questions um, or you may want to type some in and I can go ahead and address those um, if anybody has questions. And I'm just going to kind of wait for a little bit and sort of let that let that happen. Um, if you're interested um, in donating to River Relief, uh, we're the ones who put on the speaker series. Um, we also do river cleanups and education programs all along the river. Um, and you can donate at our website, riverrelief.org, or throw down in our virtual tip jar, which is at PayPal. Um, at riverleaf at riverleaf.org. And I think we have a question that was asked before um, that I didn't answer, which is, are we using a separate device to live stream? And we actually were just using, um, we're using Zoom. So some of you that are able to ask questions here, you're, you're on the Zoom feed and um, uh, they have uh, the ability to just link right into Facebook, um, which did not work for us, or YouTube, which did work, sounds like, which is pretty exciting. So we did get a question from Rob Jacobson. Now, about one third of the slides I used were from Rob Jacobson. So he said, um, American Rivers has re-engaged on the Missouri River and now has the river back on their most endangered river list after about a decade. What are the implications? Um, so I think that news came out today. I think that was uh, the announcement that American Rivers, who you know is a nationwide river advocacy organization, um, every year names its 10 most endangered rivers. And it's always kind of a rotating cast. Um, and it's been at least 10 years since the Missouri River's been on. Um, listed as one of those. Um, this year, the number one endangered river is the Mississippi, the upper Mississippi, and the number two is the Missouri River um, because of flood damage, flood control issues. So I think American Rivers is coming at this from the standpoint of really some of these last few slides that we saw, that there's you know things that we've done to manage the river that um, don't give the river enough room uh, to 
expand in those big flood years. And there's right now is kind of a, a, a sort of push and shove, a huge political kind of battle trying to figure out um, what are the things that could be done to mitigate this flooding. You know, it was untenable last year. The amount of communities and farmland that got flooded uh, was was intense. Um, and I think people are expecting more uh, more large water years like that with the climate changing. So um, with changing climate and with more people in the floodplain, um, more infrastructure in the floodplain, uh, there's this battle, you know, how, how will this play out? Um, right now there's a lot of work being done to, you know, try to build up infrastructure, flood control infrastructure, and also change the way the reservoirs are managed. There's also um, a belief amongst a lot of people that live along the Missouri River that spending energy, time, and land to create habitat along the river actually increases flood risk. Um, you know, that's debatable. The science is kind of uh, not necessarily totally with that, but there, there certainly are places where habitat projects cause levees to fail in specific areas. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's moved into the political realm, you know, so the purse strings are going to be part of how these uh, questions are answered. Um, so what the implications are is really the conversation, and it's why American Rivers does this, is to get people talking about, um, uh, about issues that they see on the river. So I was hoping we'd get a couple more questions. Um, and I uh, haven't seen any yet. So I guess what we will do is go ahead and wrap this up. Um, thanks for your patience, you guys. Uh, we did start 15 minutes late, um, but really the purpose of trying to run through all this stuff is to help um, just give a little more perspective uh, to all of us about some of the different things going on in the history of this river that shapes the river we have today. So um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. What an awesome crowd. And um, we have one more question. So Christine Garhart asked, what are the environmental impacts of less sediment flowing into the Gulf of Mexico at New Orleans? Um, and that uh, is such a great question. So, um, you know, one of the biggest impacts is all of the wetlands there at the mouth of the Mississippi River, you know, um, those were formed. And in fact, a lot of the state of Louisiana was formed by Great Plains sediment coming down the Missouri River. Um, since there's so much less sediment flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, you know, there's definitely other issues that are causing this problem, but it's definitely um, depleting those islands and wetlands that protect Louisiana from storm surge um, and from rising sea levels. So, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot going on, including the channelization of, of the shipping channel down there um, in the very lower part of the Mississippi River. Uh, but that, you know, lack of sediment is a big part. Um, now, we also have an increase in nutrients um, from our city wastewaters and uh, agriculture, um, livestock operations in the watershed, um, those are impacting that water down there too. You know, so there's a lot of impacts going on. Um, another question uh, from Linda Pleschke was, uh, what's the impact of trains versus barges to the river? So, you know, there's a lot of ways you could look at that. Um, you know, if you're talking about what are the impacts of trains versus barges like to the river itself, um, you know, obviously barges have a pretty dramatic impact. If you've ever been in a canoe um, or a small boat in the Missouri River, when a barge goes by, um, you know, like what that does to the water. It's a pretty intense impact. Um, and you know that it's intense on the animals that live in the river as well. So. There's not a lot of barges on the river anymore, 
um, but you know you know that that has an impact um, on the life of the river. Um, now, how much you know? I don't even know that people have studied that, and I'm not aware of science that studies that. Um, you know, there are studies that show that for a lot of barges, um, the amount that they can carry versus the fuel that it takes um, is actually more efficient than using trains or certainly trucks to move our goods. Um, it's somewhat debatable on the Missouri River, but um, it's, you know, barges generally come out ahead on that. Uh, so there's a different kind of environmental trade-off there. Um, and I'm not really sure of impacts of trains necessarily um, on the river itself. Although, you know, I've been on the river in a canoe when a train went by and, you know, you can feel the, that vibration on the water, you know, it can be pretty intense. Um, David Owens was asking if we could post a list of our sources for the presentation for later reference. Um, you know, a lot of those sources are from previous Big Money Speakers talks. Um, I don't necessarily have a complete list of those. And that's why I'm not a scientist, I suppose. Um, However, if uh, the, a lot of the knowledge that I've cleaned about the river, I've also gotten from reading books as well. So the Missouri River Bookshelf is a good source for um, some of those big picture stories about the Missouri River, for sure. Um, cool, so at this point, that, those are the only questions that we have. Um, thank you all so much. And I love getting a couple questions from David Owens because he usually, and for many years, he has done the sound for us um, at the Big Money Speaker Series. So he brings in his speakers and all of his chords and um, makes the sound happen, which is um, really awesome. Um, and I miss him. So I'm sad to uh, obviously not be with all of you guys tonight. Um, and I can't wait to see you again. I hope it's soon. Um, Keep in touch and um, keep uh, keep bringing your questions and keep engaging uh, your community with the river. Um, we miss you and we'll see you soon. Thank you.